uh, potentially challenging, <laughs> even though your textbook doesn't market that way. And um, and I want you to highlight some things that you may have missed in your initial reading. It's something that I guess uh, would come up if you ever take uh, basic semiconductor circuit class, but <laughs> I know many of you who are not going on to be electrical engineers so won't be, so this is my one chance to mention it. Um, so let me start out with the question itself. So if I go to the OpenStax, um, chapter 11, then it's uh, chapter 11, question 13. It, uh, um, it, most of these questions, I get it directly from the textbook. I, don't, um, sometimes I do modify it because I want to. Um, this particular question, this is the form that the question, the textbook asks. And I guess technically there is an answer key that you can look at, <laughs> but you should uh, answer in your own words. Um, so it asks the whole potentials are much larger for poor conductors than for good conductors, why? And you can kind of look through the sections to search for that answer. And what I want to get to in this virtual class session is uh, something that the textbook doesn't quite um, deeply go into. So first, the Hall effect. So um, you should look at it, <laughs> read it through it, <laughs> kind of understand where the effect comes from. It comes from the magnetic force on the charged particle as they move across the conductor. And uh, this uh, is the criteria under which the particle is no longer deflected. This is the equilibrium condition. And actually this uh, kind of set up, um, I think it's either in one of your homework questions or some of the portable TA questions, this uh, leads to some, kind of um, what we call cross the field setup, as in you have electric field one way, magnetic field one way, and the ratio of the field that leads to the charged particles moving not deflected. It, it's a common, uh, it's a useful setup that you see in many different places. Anyways, here, um, this is one of the things that are derived for the equilibrium condition. And the book goes through, well, the derivation and it uh, drives this formula for the whole potential. And I think it's worth reading carefully what each of these parameters mean. So let me just, uh, because it's got a lot of letters and some of the letters are used in a way that's um, not usually how you use it. <laughs> so it's worth uh, uh, disambiguating um, and or clarifying doubly what uh, each of those letters mean. So when so this is the formula for the Hall potential. And I guess the most confusing thing potentially is this V, the voltage V. And um, that is not the voltage V that's related to driving this current I. It's the voltage V uh, difference from the top of the conductor to the bottom of the conductor the current I that's flowing, that's uh, flowing perpendicular to the direction of the electric field that's re uh, related to the uh, voltage. So that's probably the biggest thing. The rest are fairly simple. I is the current, B is the magnetic field, L is the, the well, these two letters are super confusing. So this is L, that is I. They look identical, but from the context, I can guess that this must be L. <laughs> so L refers to the, the distance between top and bottom because what the condition sets really is the electric field. So if the distance is longer, then that results in greater voltage. Um, and uh, A is, ah, there it is, area A, that's the cross-sectional area of the um, cross-sectional area of the conductor. And E is the charge, the electric electron charge, charge of the charge carrier. And N, I think I need to find it. Um, it says N here, the number of charge carriers per volume. It's what we call uh, charge density or the number density of the charges. Um, so, so that's the formula. Uh, hopefully you read through the derivation and the derivation makes sense. 
And now the question is, as you are looking at this formula, uh, why would this formula imply that um, that the charges with uh, that the, the that poor conductors result in um, greater a greater hall potential than the uh, uh, good conductors. And I think the first thing to kind of understand, internalize is this thing, which is um, kind of the question of um, under what condition. So because there's a kind of easy, smart aleck uh, loophole where I can make the the whole potential of uh, all the conductors exactly the same. I can measure the whole, whole potential when the current is zero. When the current is zero, um, whole potential will be zero. This will be basically a piece of conductor that's not doing anything. <laughs> so, so, you know, there's this current I, it's a potentially a free parameter. So you have to first imagine I as being a fixed parameter. And I think that, um, get rid of some of potential sources of paradox. Um, as in, you know, you might be thinking along this way, which is um, like, if you have a poor conductor, that shouldn't it mean um, smaller amount of current flowing? Well, um, you know, the smaller amount of current flowing that could lead to, um, that could lead to there being uh, smaller hull potential, but, by fixing the current I, we have uh, ruled out the possibility. So for the basis of comparison, we are using the situation where all the different conductors have the same current I flowing through it. And once you fix that, then I think uh, what that means hopefully is relatively clear that, you know, that must mean those conductors must have different amount of currents uh, applied across them. Then, <laughs> so, so, um, so this situation comes up a lot. You know, what parameter do you keep fixed? Here, the parameter we are keeping fixed is the amount of current I. So given that we set up the situation so that all the conductors have the same amount of current flowing, then why would a poor conductor have, have greater, um, uh, greater hole potential? So it relates to these parameters on the bottom, N, E, A. And I guess the textbook answer relates to only to N. And I think that's uh, one big part that I want to address. But I also want to address this. Um, think about how these parameters would change if you had the same material, but just a you know, piece of conductor that has higher resistance or higher resistance. And the way to get that, or one way to get that is to make the area A smaller. So. Imagine making the area A smaller, then yeah, then the whole potential will go up. And if you scroll up to kind of see how this was derived, then all this can be really tied to this. This is a description of current as being charge density uh, times the drift velocity times the area. So um, it, if you are keeping the amount of current the same, then anything that negatively impacts the resistance or make the resistance higher, either um, reducing the number of charged uh, carriers or the reducing the cross-sectional area, they will both increase the drift velocity, which means it increases the electric field and so on. So, so that's a kind of one way in general why whenever you have a poorer conducting piece that it would uh, it, it would lead to a higher hull potential. Oh, I guess, oh, keeping this L same as well. <laughs> and this uh, one particular piece about the number of charge carriers, that's, um, I think that's uh, actually kind of easy to miss. So let me just point you to the section here. So back in chapter nine, when we were doing, you know, introducing circuit stuff, we have the model of conduction. That's where that expression for drift velocity comes from actually. Um, yeah, drift velocity comes from. And I think there's some piece that's a little bit left um, 
um, I think uh, um, more implicit than explicit in the textbook section, which is the sort of um, source of resistance, like where does resistance come from? There's this figure that kind of implies at it, you know, as the charges move, they uh, bounce on impurities and whatnot, and that slows them down. And that means to maintain the same drift velocity, you have to apply a bigger electric field. So that's one, origin of resistance. And that's the description that uh, that's relevant for most uh, uh, most conductors. Um, it, uh, what these charges are bouncing on could be um, um, like impurities in the crystal lattice of the conductor or uh, what's called a phonon, mean, uh, meaning uh, like vibration. Now, for different types of material, something called a semiconductor, which I think is in this list here. Um, oh, wait, I think there's one entry for semiconductor and they don't quite, oh, wait, wait, no, they do. So for semiconductors, um, the biggest source of, the biggest reason the uh, conduction is limited it's not that the impurities, but the number of charge carriers. Yeah, so in this table, it doesn't spell it out directly. That's what I mean. It's kind of more <laughs> implicit than explicit. I mean, you know, they do give you, you know, semiconductors, carbon, it has a lower conductivity than all these other conductors. So this is a poorer conductor. And um, when you, and this is the paragraph I kind of just, one need to refer to, um, you know, conductors have and uh, more here. Semiconductors are intermediate, having far fewer free charges than conductors, but having properties that make the number of free charges depend strongly on the type and amount of impurities in the semiconductor. And uh, what I want to point to is that with uh, semiconductors, the number of uh, free charges becomes on uh, rather critical parameter. So, uh, so I think the the question that's asked would be much more clearly distinguished if uh, we are asking you to compare like conductors to semiconductors. So semiconductors would have a higher hull potential, and the reason would be that they have some. Uh, oops, uh, uh, they the uh, semiconductors have a higher hall potential. And the reason would be that they have a smaller number of uh, uh, charge carriers. And that alone will, and that alone will make the, the hall potential higher. 